Hello, and thank you for joining uh, the next installment of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Technology Engagement Center's Tech Talk series. The Tech Talk series brings together policymakers and newsmakers to talk about the latest issues in technology policy. Uh, the U.S. Chamber's Technology Engagement Center, which is hosting this event today, uh, is the tech hub of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, uh, meant to tell the story of the benefits of technology for all Americans and advocating for rational policy solutions to ensure that that technology is available. Uh, today, we actually are joined uh, by a special guest, um, the uh, one of the commissioners from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, Commissioner Keith Sonderling who was confirmed on a bipartisan vote to serve on the commission. Uh, prior to his confirmation, uh, the commissioner served as acting and deputy administrator of the Wage and Hour Division at the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, prior to that, uh, he actually uh, was a partner at one of Florida's oldest and most prestigious law firms. Uh, Sonderling received his uh, BS from the University of Florida and his JD from Nova Southeastern University. Uh, had an opportunity to actually testify in front of the commissioner and the rest of his colleagues uh, on AI issues uh, just uh, a few months ago. And uh, Commissioner, uh, thank you for joining us. We're glad to have you. Thank you for having me. And I really appreciate everything the chamber has done related to uh, technology and artificial intelligence. And for you, Jordan, specifically, uh, you've been a really big uh, ally and help for us here as we navigate uh, regulating and enforcing the laws related to uh, employment discrimination and artificial intelligence. And you were one of the premier witnesses when uh, the commission had our first ever hearing on artificial intelligence. So I do really appreciate all the continued support you're giving us here at the commission. Well, we're, we're happy to do it and we appreciate your leadership as well. And, uh, you know, let's let's get into it. Um, so what what got you interested in artificial intelligence in the first place? Uh, you know, what are some of the promises you see, some of the challenges you see and and, and, and what's really spoken to you about this issue? So we have a very big portfolio here at the EEOC. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with the agency here, we are the premier civil rights agency in the U.S. and we're responsible for enforcing laws that make it unlawful to discriminate in the workplace and to promote equal employment opportunity. So when you think of some of the big ticket discrimination items like the Me Too movement, pay equity, all types of age discrimination, religious discrimination, disability discrimination, uh, that's our agency here. So uh, in addition to that work, you know, really looking to see what the future of employment is, the future of the workforce is, that's really where I started getting interested in artificial intelligence. And what I found was when I start, when I dove into it, there was a lot of confusion about what that really means. Is it meaning displacing workers? And now with ChatGPT, we're hearing so much more about that. Um, or is it about how machine learning and AI technologies are coming for human resources? And that's really what I found the biggest issue was right away, that there were already thousands of products out there marketed towards human resources departments to essentially displace some of those human decision making with AI. And if you think about why this market is so ripe in the human resources space, because generally what has been the problem with human resources? The human. Why is there bias in hiring? Because of human decision making. That's why my agency has existed since the 1960s. That's why we collect over $500 million for victims of discrimination every single year. So there, that problem exists, obviously. And how can AI help remove some of that bias? How can we automate some of these decisions to remove bias and actually allow employers to take what they really want to do, which is a non-discriminatory, which is the law, of course, skills-based approach to hiring, talent-based approach to hiring, hiring based on merits, and removing any of those biases that the EEOC says you're not allowed to make a decision on, such as if you're male or female, what, what country you were born in, what religion you are, if you have a disability. And AI really has the promise to do that by looking at data and making decisions based upon those data points. So that's really why there's been so much interest in this. In addition to the efficiency, which we're seeing across the board for AI being used in businesses, right? Whether it's to making deliveries faster, whether it's making widgets faster, whether it's reviewing accounting sheets, and the same goes um, with HR. You know, companies now with remote work and online hiring, they're getting hundreds of thousands or even millions of resumes. And you don't even have enough people in your HR departments anymore to review those. So relying on AI, machine learning to review these resumes, to look for patterns, 
um, is really what employers want to do because they need to do that because of the sheer volume of um, the changes in, in the workforce. So whether you're aware of it or not, AI is being used in the HR process, in the employment process, in the employee life cycle process, really from A to Z. From the beginning to make a job description, you can use AI to do the whole thing. You can use AI to post the job description, to advertise, to find the right candidates. You could use AI to review the resumes. You could use AI to make a preliminary offer. You could use AI to do the whole interview, whether it's through chat bots or video interviews. There's AI out there that will assess um, what the candidate's expectations are for salary, um, whether or not they'll take it or not. And then when the employee gets there, there's AI that will do some of the software, use software to do the scheduling, um, use AI to actually give them assignments, and then use AI to do performance reviews. And there's even AI out there that will tell employees that they're fired. So this isn't, um, you know, this is not an industry that is going to be impacted by AI in the future. It, it's happening right now. And with each one of those um, uses in HR that I mentioned, there's a lot of significant benefits to it. And at the same time, if it's not properly designed, just like any other potential issues with bias in HR or improper decision making using HR, the problem here is that because of the scale and magnitude employers are using this, it can scale discrimination so much more than any one individual. So what I've been trying to relay is it's all about how you implement the AI. It's all about what you are going to select, how you are going to use it, for what purpose, and how do you comply with the laws, and how do you use AI to minimize some of the longstanding bias instead of making it worse. And that's really where this very complex discussion that you and I have had, uh, that you've testified about, that I'm really looking in there, is how do we create this AI that is really properly designed using the right data sets and what is data sets in HR, your applicant pool, your employees, and to make sure that the results are based upon that data and not somebody's bias or bias within those data sets. So pretty similar to a lot of the other AI issues, but using AI in HR, it's really understandable because everyone's applied for a job, everyone's been in the workforce. Um, so a lot of the examples of AI positive use in HR or AI bias, people really can understand. Well, I think that's very interesting that you bring up, you know, the benefits, but the risks uh, that come with artificial intelligence. You know, we see uh, that there's tremendous um, potential for AI to fill in gaps where there are worker shortages, for example, or where we need more help um, you know, speeding up decision making for, for things like employment. Uh, but at the same time, you bring up the risks. And uh, there's also gap filling that we've talked about there at the, at the chamber. We recently came out with a report. Uh, from our uh, bipartisan AI commission that was led by John Delaney and Mike Ferguson about the need for Congress to look at the potential gaps that are out there uh, in regulation. I think uh, that, that segues a little bit into uh, a question I have for you about an article you actually recently published uh, in the North Carolina Journal of Law and uh, uh, Technology. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so I thought it was really important that to talk about in this article all the different private initiatives that not only tech companies, but trade association, academia are doing in this area. Because, you know, we're in the government here. We're never going to understand the technology without significant more funding. What we understand here at the EEOC is employment discrimination. And what we understand is if there's results, we see the results. And if there's discrimination, we can figure it out from them, just like we've been doing um, since the 1960s. But now you're laying on this technology these algorithms, all these various other things that are, have been outside of our world and how are, and we're being forced now to enforce our laws, to regulate it, to give guidance on that. And that's difficult to do when you don't understand the underlying technology and when you don't understand the mindset of the tech companies who are designing these programs really to help us in our mission here and help employers comply with these laws help employers make decisions or help employers make unlawful decisions. Whatever the issues are there, we really need to understand where they're coming from. So in this article, I really talked about how the government needs to work with the regulated industry here. It can't be a situation where in the past with other regulated industries where the industry just goes off by themselves, makes a lot of money, the government catches up through significant fines. Just because this technology is so impactful, and especially in HR, in, in our area, it really can help 
employees find the right jobs. It can help employers retain their employees as well by using you know artificial intelligence to make sure that they're doing their jobs properly, they're in their best jobs, and they understand what their skills are, um, et cetera. So in this article, I really focus in on what the big tech companies have said about their AI policies and their lawful and ethical uses of AI. So when you read it, you see, wow, you know, even though they're all competitors, whether it's uh, Google, Amazon, uh, Meta, Workday, Salesforce, you name it, they're all out there, but they're all using significant resources that they have as large tech companies to invest in ethical AI. And you've seen it everything from the president of Microsoft releasing statements and being very much out there working with the regulated community. And if you look at these principles, they're really pretty close to each other. So in a sense, you're having consensus from the big tech community of what you know, these principles should be regarding ethical AI, transparency, trust, you know, proper uses, you know, a lot of the buzzwords which you've heard, you know, ar around the world, and they're giving it for free. So you look like a, a company like Microsoft that has really significant resources um, that can build these whole ethical AI teams, and they're putting it all online, and they're giving you the framework of how to implement how they're implementing ethical AI, how they think it should be used for small and medium sized businesses, not just in tech to basically copy and paste. And I think that is really a service that they're doing if you think about it, um, because if you're a small size business and you want to buy AI um, as a SaaS software and you can't develop yourself or you are a startup and you want to have principles related to how you are going to use design and develop technology that you're going to be selling, you have some of the biggest name companies in the world in the tech industry. You know, you name it. Like I said, it's all in the paper. IBM, all the all the traditional names investing in PhDs, ethicists, lawyers, you know, to, to really look at this. And they're giving it to you for free online. And if you use those principles that you think are, are the best, even though a lot of them are very similar, and implement them in your business before using AI or while developing AI, no matter what the use case is, that's that's better than nothing. And that's a lot of free resources you wouldn't have. So I've been really encouraging people to look, um, and this is what this article argues, to look from there, at least for a base in your company. And I also talk about what trade associations are doing. And you know, I really also highlighted the, um, your report um, that you put out. At, um, about you know how companies can use AI, but also how regulators should be looking at AI as well, and the principles. And I highlight other trade associations. I highlight other um, governments in there as well has really taken this proactive approach, is saying here are the principles. But you know, if you look at your report as well, that's free to the entire public. You don't need to be a, a member of the Chamber of Commerce to see that. You can go on the internet and you can use those tools. So from a regulator's perspective, I'm encouraged. You know, in the meantime, in the absence of a you know, an AI commission, which we'll talk about, or AI uh, legislation, um, you can have those principles out there now, and there's just so many resources. Well, I think that's what was so different from, say, take an issue like privacy, where this wasn't as first and foremost, I think, uh, publicly in terms of how companies were looking. But I think when it comes to AI, I think you bring up an excellent point, is that companies really are proactively thinking ahead about how to uh, adopt trustworthy or ethical AI. Uh, they've also got a lot of other resources out there too, um, you know, like the NIST framework, for example, that's out there. Um, you know, I, you got into the regulations uh, piece, Commissioner. You know, do you think current federal regulations are adequate? Uh, are there any proposals that are troubling uh, to you uh, that you see right now? Well, from my perspective, I can take the very easy Washington D.C. answer and say I'm in the executive branch. Whatever laws Congress passes and they relate to the EEOC and we have authority for it, we will uh, faithfully enforce. And I don't get to make legislation uh, here uh, in the executive branch, although that's a whole other topic for debate. Um, but no, in all seriousness, um, my position has been, and we are limited to the laws that Congress gave us to enforce since the 1960s, is that all of the laws we have, whether it's Title VII, Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, you name it, apply equally to AI as they do human decision making. Because all the AI tools, especially in HR, you know, what are they doing? They're replicating, they're amplifying human decision making. So at the end of the day, there is going to be an employment decision from these tools, or there may not be. But if there is, just like any human 
employment decision that an HR professional makes, that a manager makes, that's where our jurisdiction comes in and that's where we regulate. And I think that's really important to keep in mind, at least from agencies uh, like mine, the EEOC, is that you know, we've been regulating employment decisions um, for a long time. And at the end of the day, that's what these tools are doing and we can't lose sight of that. And in a way, they are using advanced technology to do that. They are using machine learning, all these tools that uh, individuals didn't have before. And again, like I said earlier, they're making them at scale, like your resume reviewing. You have one person reviewing a resume. It takes a long time to sift through resumes. Um, yet using machine learning, you could look at millions of resumes in 0.5 seconds. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a decision on that. And that's what we have to look at. Was that, discriminate, that, was that decision lawful? Or was it unlawful and discriminatory? So I, I try to keep um, reminding everyone that at the end of the day, we're going to look at the results of these tools. And if there's bias there, you know, that's our job to backtrack it based on this existing framework. And especially some of the more advanced AI that do employment assessments, that do video interviews, they're still using underlying industrial and organization psychology tests or employee assessment that have been around for a long time. They're just di digitizing them and using machine learning to get them you know, to the employee uh, on the digital interviews. Um, but you know the, the principles of that is what we've been doing for a long time. So the easy answer is to say, we have laws, they may be old, but they're um, not outdated. You know, they apply to each decision the employer is gonna make, whether it's a human or AI. The more complicated um, question which you alluded to is like, do we need new laws related to AI? And you know, I'm I'm very torn on that because I believe that our laws here at the EEOC do a really great job of preventing uh, employment discrimination, promoting equal employment opportunity. So, um, whether or not Congress is, decides there needs to be an AI commission or one agency that's dealing with AI, I think that's going to be very difficult in the sense where our investigators here, you know, our policy staff here, our lawyers here, really know employment discrimination. You know, at the FTC, they know competition. At the SEC, they know securities law. At the National Labor Relations uh, Board, they know uh, union issues. And I still think you ultimately still need that expertise, which only these individualized, specialized agencies can do. Because even if you have an AI commission, um, they are not going to know employment law. They're not going to know the employment decisions that are made. You know, they're not going to know securities law. So, uh, you know, I'm very much for having our existing regulatory and legal framework and just making sure that we're applying this technology, the OLA, and that will take potentially having experts that can work with um, us at these agencies to understand the technology better um, related to these longstanding laws. So, you know, you see a lot of buzz in DC and I know you're intimately involved in those conversations, but from my perspective, I think we are very well equipped to handle these kinds of cases through AI, because at the end of the day, simplifying it, it's just an employment decision. And that's what we know. You know, well, well, Congress hasn't acted yet in many ways uh, with regard to AI. Um, they have done some previous legislation in the last few years, like the National AI Initiative Act and things like that. But in terms of regulation, uh, that hasn't really happened yet. Um, but in that absence, we have seen some states like uh, uh, California look at legislation. New York City actually just uh, passed a law. Um, do you have any thoughts about the state role here? Yeah, I, I do. And I, I really think this is where it's getting complicated. And in addition to the states, we'll, of course, talk about um, the EUAI Act, which you're also very familiar with and, and done work on. So this is really very complicated here. And, and I've said this many times, you know, if a state or local government want to take up the very, very complex area of algorithmic decision making when it comes to employment. Um, hats off, off to you. But at the same time, it's gonna, it can't create this regulatory patchwork, which we see in employment law um, in, in many states uh, and, and in other areas of the law too. So it can be really difficult for um, international multinational, multi-state employers to be able to comply with. And also you can't lose sight that obviously federal law is still going to apply, you know, equally in these areas. So the first state that kind of dove into this area was in Illinois and they um, had an, an act related to facial recognition during employment interviews. So very much like this conversation now, 
there's programs out there that will look at your face during an interview and say, you know, how many you're smiling, uh, how many, how many directly you're looking at the camera, if you're blinking and then make an assessment based on that, whether or not you should get hired. Obviously there's a lot of significant issues um, with that. For instance, facial recognition, facial, um, how you move your face. Um, if you smile, that may not mean you're the best, going to be the best employee. Um, or not, and making an employment decision on that may lead to discrimination. For instance, if I'm disabled and I can't smile and you want to only hire salespeople who smile, and that's what the AI is looking for, that could be disability discrimination. If you're from a country that it's improper to smile during a sales meeting, and that's again what you're looking for, that could be national origin discrimination. So you see how quickly um, this can lead to discrimination. So Illinois, and then later on Maryland, um, basically said there needs to be so much, there needs to be consent um, to use this. And it really limited um, facial recognition, put so much burden on employers using facial recognition in those states where it almost impossible or difficult to use. So th those are, again, very specific, you know, look how specific that is to facial recognition algorithms in employment interviews, one area. Um, and then New York City really was the, the, the pioneer in a sense to come out with a full blown um, law to regulate artificial intelligence uh, in hiring. And that law just went to effect uh, this summer after some delays. And that's that law really deals with if you're going to use this in new york city um, ai in hiring and promotions then you need to have um, an independent audit post the results of that audit this uh, yearly pre-deployment audit to make sure that it's not um, biased and there's not going to be discrimination in the systems uh, knowledge to the candidate um, that they're going to be subject to this technology being able to opt out now the issue there is as you just heard, it only applies to um, hiring and promotion. And the only categories that you need to check for bias on in those audits and in those disclosures is for race and ethnicity and sex. If you look at federal law, as you heard from the beginning, you know we regulate all aspects of employment, not just hiring and promotion, firing, wages, training, benefits, really anything, terms and conditions of your employment. And it's not just for race, sex, and ethnicity that we're looking to make sure that there's no discrimination. It's, it's much broader than that, you know, where you have everything from religion to disability to LGBT to race to color, um, national origin. So it's so expansive. So in a sense, complying with New York, you may say, well, I'm in compliance with this. I've done an audit. I've posted the results. I'm good, I don't need to do anything else. Well, federal law requires so much more. And I think that's where some of the confusion is. That's where some of the false sense of security is that while I'm complying with New York City's law, my AI is compliant. And it may be for that very specific purpose in hiring promotions, but maybe not for management, maybe not for salary compensation setting. So you could see where um, for employers who are engaging in that, and putting that effort in, if you're going to be doing it, then well, not, why not do it for all the laws that the EEOC covers? So that is the one that went into effect. But now we're seeing a lot of other states and jurisdiction getting into it. Um, no surprise to um, many who pay attention to this area. The state of California um, is also trying to get involved in this, and they have a proposal, uh, their Assembly Bill 331, which really takes a different approach um, than New York and gets much more granular, talks about all the different types of system, really covers all the types of employment decision making that can be used. Also, their California Civil Rights Council has proposals as well. And like I said, it's not just hiring promotion. It's really they'll list out all the different types of uses. Um, basically, what I mentioned earlier, how it really relates to employment. But the bigger issue um, related to some of the California proposals and in the EU is this thorny issue here about, you know, who is liable for using these tools. And under our laws here at the EEOC, we only have jurisdiction over three parties, the employer companies, unions, and then uh, staffing agencies. Um, nowhere in there is those AI vendors. So no matter who makes a decision for um, 
you, whether it's using AI or whether it's using some, you know, just an employee to make a decision, that company is going to be liable. And that's what's a little different about the use of AI in HR is that the employer is 100% liable. So whatever the vendor said in selling the program, whatever the vendor said it's going to do related to diversity, equity, inclusion, whether it's equal pay, whatever, you know, the use is in HR, if there are issues and it does the opposite, we only look at the employer and we only look at the employer's use of it at that location for that job. It's that granular and specific. So vendors don't have liability in this area. And that is really something the EU is trying to change. Um, as you know, they've designated uh, use in employment as high risk, which puts a lot of additional requirements on there. But another part of the EU proposal is relating to vendor liability and having the vendors be liable for any of the, the actions that these AI makes. And California, in their proposal uh, for the civil rights division, they also said that vendors would share in the liability. So that's sort of kind of the big question mark um, related to some of these state local and international laws is where the vendors, the AI vendors, who are not the employers of that employee are going to fit into this equation when it comes to legal liability. But for this time being, um, the EEOC is only going to look at the company who is using the AI, not the developers. I, I think you brought up a really good point about patchworks as well, too. Um, you know, if you start seeing states, um, you know, getting into the game of employment with regard to AI, um, you mentioned Europe is now looking at it. Um, you know, actually, one of the things that that we saw very recently was that DC actually put together an AI proposal that would have impacted small businesses. Um, and we actually uh, just released a report that actually mentioned that a majority of small businesses are concerned about having to comply with out of state uh, AI regulation. And and that's a major issue. And I think that that's that's an interesting point you bring up about you know the patchwork problem that 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 could come up from this. Um, you know, how important is it that you have access to, to quality data, too, as well? I think one of the other pieces here, you know, is that you may have companies that may be on the hook to make a determination that, um, you know, like an impact assessment, you know, how is, is their AI system, uh, you know, ensuring that they're being fair and employment and things like that. But then if they don't have access to data, how do they do that? What are your thoughts about that, too? Yeah, this is a really um, tricky question because, you know, from our perspective, you know, what is the data in the decision-making tools here, that's the employee's, you know, the applicant's resume, their application file, and then all the tools that go into looking at saying, do they have the skills for this job related to this job recommendation? So it is very important for employers who want to use uh, AI in HR to really understand you know, where their data is, because a lot of the vendors have done studies and have done tests to show how the AI is less discriminatory than human than humans, HR managers um, who are, have been making decisions in the past. And the data that they use are more aggregate data, BLS data, other employers data. But from the EEOC's perspective, when we do an investigation on whether it's AI or any other hiring practices, the data we're looking at is, you know, let's say it's a hiring case. We're looking at the applicant pool in that area, in that part of the country for that location um, and what the actual applicant pool is and the diversity of that applicant pool to see if there was uh, the AI had a disparate impact on certain groups who were or were not qualified uh, originally in that pool. And I think that's really important here to understand that you know the data being fed to this the AI algorithms is really for the most part in some of these disparate impact cases where you have you know a neutral policy that uh, discriminates, um, that's going to be key. And you know if the data there is made up of one race, one gender, one national origin, you know the AI is really that's what's going to think it's going to think is the most important thing, and it could replicate or amplify um, the status quo. So so much of it. Um, of what goes into the AI and having a diverse applicant pool, which employers really strive to do every anyway, um, representative of their local population of the applicant pool is really what's key to using the AI if it's designed properly. Now, you may have the most perfect uh, data set, the most perfect applicant pool um, that represents the, uh, the demographics of the area. And, and look, if the AI is not set up properly within your company, 
you don't have those policies, procedures, and tools in place to prevent discrimination, you know, a bad actor can go in there and inject their bias. And for instance, say we, we don't want to pick up any resumes that are, you know, female or have any indication of being female, like going to a women's colleges or playing women's sports team, you know, with a few clicks, you can completely poison that entire data set. So that's why there's just so much on employers when they're using this, not only the quality of the data going into the AI um, to ensure that there's no disparate impact, um, which again is that unintentional discrimination, that data-based discrimination versus that intentional discrimination of somebody using the AI for the wrong purpose here. Because at the end of the day, under our laws, because we're dealing with civil rights, whether or not you intend to discriminate, if you intend to discriminate, or you don't intend to discriminate, if discrimination occurs, the employer is going to be liable. So it's extra careful here. The second part of the data conversation for employers to be aware about is where does this data go? And this goes a little bit outside of my world into the uh, who owns the data and data privacy. Uh, Jordan, this is uh, uh, more your lane, but you know I can tell you that a lot of these programs, um, the data goes to the vendors and the vendors store that data. Uh, especially when you're doing advanced assessments using AI or using AI to do some of these pattern recognitions in resumes or applicant history um, to see if they're the best candidate. And then they're essentially the employer will get a report either ranking um, the candidates or telling you what their skills are, but not, not having that underlying data set. But when the EEOC comes to investigate, you know, the employer is responsible for having all the data related to all the employment decisions um, in basically their entire application file. And if the employer doesn't have that and they say, well, we don't have it, it's the vendor who has that, that's not going to fly because the employer is responsible for keeping those records. So these are really um, conversations that um, need to be happening with both you know, the regulators to raise this awareness issue to the buyers of these technologies, the companies using it, so that they can demand that their vendors are also in compliance and giving them the information they need for all this to work um, properly. And that's why it's so important for me to have conversations like this and engage with um, trade groups um, like yours to be able to raise awareness of this because you know there's a lot of significant benefits here and it really can help employers make uh, decisions based upon uh, metrics and not just based on bias, um, which we've seen in the past, but there's just so much more um, that goes with it versus, you know, just one person interviewing another person. <coughs> Commissioner, any other thoughts you have today that you haven't shared with us already? No, I just really um, am grateful for all your work for being here today and really ask for everyone in this community to engage more with us because we get employment discrimination. We get promoting equal employment opportunity. We understand complying with these laws from the 1960s and 1970s um, that uh, impact everyone who wants to enter in the workforce or is in the workforce. What we are learning is now this technology and how the technology is helping us um, meet our mission um, as well, but also how this technology can cause additional um, unwarranted, uh, unnecessary violations um, of these laws. So there's new stakeholders involved here. Um, we were before, we're very comfortable working with uh, employers and unions and staffing agencies. So my ask is those who are developing the technology, those who are interested in developing AI in the space to help um, the workforce, to help advance the workforce, to eliminate discrimination, is to work with us and to make sure that we are providing you with all the tools you need to actually help develop, deploy these tools in accordance with our longstanding civil rights. Got one final question I, I ask folks on AI. Uh, we try to make the point that AI is not like the movies, but if you got a favorite AI movie, uh, I'll let you jump in. Oh, geez. Favorite AI movie. Huh. I don't know. I don't know. I think you stumped me. I don't even know. What are some examples of AI movies? <laughs> Star Trek, Terminator, uh, oh, all those. All things. right, we'll go with Terminator then. <laughs> um, anyway, well, Commissioner, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, EEOC Commissioner Keith Sonderling, uh, thank you for your leadership. Uh, and we look forward to working with you uh, in the future. Um, once again, I want to thank everyone for joining today's Tech Talk. Uh, if you want to learn more about what we're doing at the Chamber on technology policy issues, I encourage you to visit AmericanInnovators.com. 
Thank you again, and we'll see you next time. 